Hey everybody, welcome to this wonderful Wednesday webinar. It's a very special webinar because honestly, I got two very special people on this webinar with me and I'm excited to be able to uh, spend time with them and with you. Uh, we are here at the first week of Advent, this great season where we prepare our hearts for our coming King, Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, just coming out of how we celebrated the Feast of Christ the King, the solemnity that honors him as the King of the universe. Uh, and, and everything that, that goes with that. And then in Advent, as we once again spend time uh, looking at ourselves and saying, we know that Jesus is the king of the universe, but is he the king of our hearts? And that's, that's the most important thing in all this, is that you know, we allow Jesus to be our own personal king, that we submit our lives to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about that and what that looks like. And Paul and sister are going to share uh, about what that has meant to them in their lives, how they've experienced the lordship and kingship of Christ, and, and offer some practical advice to each one of you about how you can have a deeper experience of the lordship of Christ in your life. And uh, we'll have plenty of time for, for some Q&A. I'm going to start us with a prayer, and then I'm going to ask Sister and Paul to introduce themselves. I'm going to give you a few tips on how you can be interactive and ask questions of us as a panel. And then we're going to turn it over to Sister to get right into it. But before that, let's just uh, turn our hearts and minds to, to Christ, our King and our Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, you are the King. You are the King of the universe, and we uh, turn our hearts to you because we love you. We want to live under your Lordship. We want to know what it means to be children of the King. Help us as uh, we journey through Advent and uh, just grow in our anticipation of your return, that we would live in this moment under your Lordship. Pour out your grace upon our hearts. Open us, uh, open our hearts to your truth and let us be changed by that truth. And just thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you have already come and, and died for us and that you now sit on the throne of the universe May you also reign on the throne of our hearts. Pour out your grace that we would be able to do all this. And we ask this on your name, Jesus. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, now, obviously, I could do an introduction, but it wouldn't do justice to how awesome this lovely sister is. So, Sister Marion, would you introduce yourself to our uh, webinar audience this afternoon? Yes. Hi, I am Sister Miriam James Highland, and I'm a member of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. I'm a part of a missionary community, and I live in South Texas, and I've had just the distinct privilege and joy of working um, with Stupidville conferences in, in the past several years and getting to hang out with cool people like y'all. So it's it's great to be here this evening, and I'm delighted. So thanks for having me. All right. <laughs> also on this webinar, we're very blessed to have uh, somebody that I'm just, have been really blessed to be able to call friend. We've done a lot of ministry together over the years, but more importantly, just his friendship and brotherhood in my life has meant a lot. Mr. Paul George. Paul, oh, tell, tell us. Hey, John. How's it going, man? Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be with you. I don't have a, I have it like sister, but um, <laughs> it's great I like to be with you guys. Answer. I know, I know. Uh, I'm down here in South Louisiana. I've been working with Steubenville Conferences uh, for many years, and um, it's just a pleasure to be with you guys, and particularly as we begin the season of Advent. So I think it's an amazing season where we kind of pause and stop for a moment and begin to think about the question, is Jesus Lord of our life? Amen. Amen. All right, so everyone else... Uh who's on this webinar, you know, across the Fruity Plain and maybe uh, even some neighbors to the north. Uh, one of the things that you see, um, you probably have on the side of your screen is a go to webinar control panel. And when you, as you look down that, you'll see uh, a box that says questions. Now this is where you can type in questions for anyone on the panel. Uh, we're gonna be glad to respond to those. So what I'd ask you to do is to click on the arrow that says questions and type in your name and where you are uh, from so that we can kind of get a sense of who's on this webinar with us. Um, and uh, once again, at any point during the webinar, if you have a question or a comment, uh, you know, please just feel free to type it in. We've got people from Clinton, uh, Clinton Ohio, Dubuque, Iowa, Missouri, uh, people from the Bronx. Hey, shout out to all of our New York friends. Thank you for being a part of this. We've got Florida. People from Pittsburgh, hey, New Brunswick, Canada, welcome aboard. Wisconsin, Chicago, 
people from, hey, fellow Louisiana, Maryland, D.C., all over the place. And that's just exciting. We've got a lot of great people on this call. We're glad that, uh, that you've joined us on this webinar this afternoon. All righty. Um, and so we're going to be talking about the Lordship of Christ. This is an important thing because if we have a solemnity that celebrates Jesus as our King, we need to know what that means to us as Catholics so that we can truly live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And to start us off, I'm going to turn it over to Sister Miriam. And maybe, Sister, you can just share about how you've experienced that and, and, and what's on your heart for everyone that's on this uh, webinar with us today. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I really lately have just got, undergone just a major transformation in my life and it still continues to happen. And one of the things that I find myself, you know, just continually encountering God and his beauty and mystery. And I often just ask him, you know, I ask the Lord, like, show me who you are. Like, who are you? Who, who are you, this magnificent God? And the, the title that for me I've been proclaiming out loud over my life is that God is sovereign. He is sovereign. And I was just reading the catechism, and I was thinking, you know, because as, bap as baptized Christians, we're baptized into the, 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 into Christ as priest, prophet, and king. And I think for Americans, you know, we have kind of a suspicion of kings. We say, well, didn't we, <laughs> didn't we get rid of that a few hundred years ago? So, we, and this idea of kingship, no, it's kind of foreign to us. And, but I was thinking of one of my favorite stories, the Lord of the Rings, I, hands down one of my favorite stories, and you think of Aragorn and the return of the king, and how Middle Earth is set aright again when the king comes into his sovereignty. And, but um, in the Catechism, uh, number 786, so if people want to pull that out, they can. So part of the paragraph says, finally, the people of God shares in the royal office of Christ. He exercises his kingship by drawing all men to himself through his death and resurrection. Christ, King and Lord of the universe, made himself the servant of all, for he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And I'm continually amazed, especially as we finish this year of mercy, of, you know, Pope Francis at the very beginning of the year wrote that beautiful letter, and the very first sentence was that Jesus Christ is the face of the Father, there's mercy. Mm -hmm. And I just am so just transfixed at times by God. It's just like, who, who are you? Like, it, it, his goodness and his kindness and his mercy and love and beauty and justice and truth, and it's overwhelming. And all of us, you know, have a deep desire in our hearts to be seen and known and loved and sure. we have a desire to worship and um i think that when we encounter christ and who he is not who we think he is not our old broken patterns of thought not you know who christ reveals himself to be is, is the man who loves us who lays down his life for us and to bring us into his divinity you know the catechism number one says that you know god is infinitely perfect and blessed in himself and a plan of sheer goodness, you know, creates us to bring us into his own blessed life, his own divine life. And that kind of God who is, you know, outside of our control, who's outside the box, who just brings us into sheer glory. I, I just, to me, it just is so utterly captivating. And who wouldn't want to love a God like that? Who wouldn't want to be loved by a God like, a, by a God like that? And so I think for me, when I think of Christ the King, um, this continual prayer to be drawn into that for, you know, cause he loves me. He, he gives his life for me through his death and resurrection and calls me into that life. And that is his kingship, not somebody who lords it over, not somebody who is a tyrant, not somebody who's trying to manipulate us or trying to, you know, uh, get us to do something we don't want to do. Uh, he's trying to bring us into his glory. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I just can't. It's, that's Christianity. Like that is the heart of Christianity. That comes to just he takes on our sin and death to destroy it to bring us into his divinity and glory. And I say amen to that. Amen. Amen. And what was that passage from the Catechism that you shared? The first one. Number seven eighty six. I'll bring it up here. And when he talks about yeah us as a priestly, prophetic, and royal people. Um, our inheritance is just so great. I I feel like I live so impoverished most of the time, and I have such great inheritance that I don't even first know about, but secondly, live out. And there's so much more, you know, there's so much, there's always more, you know, like they say when in Narnia at the very end of the story, further up and further in, right? <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Awesome. I'm trying to get it here for everyone to see. That's a great idea. 786. Yeah. All righty. Well, you know, sister, how, 
how have you grown? I mean, what 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 do you do? I mean, obviously you have a a community of prayer that you're connected with, but for you as a as a child of God, as you stand before the Lord, what do you do to make sure that you're living in that proper relationship with Jesus as the King? Well, I mean, obviously, being a sister, a religious sister, I mean, I receive the sacraments of a Christian, or receiving the sacraments often, so I go to daily mass and, and go to confession often, and obviously the devotion to Our Lady, I'm consecrated to our Blessed Mother. But I really firmly believe, and I'm more and more convinced um, every day of the, the necessary uh, step of de- encounter every day, conversion, daily conversion. And I go to God every day throughout the day when I see parts of myself that are broken, that are that need redemption that need his that I need a savior I need a savior I can't save myself I've been trying to save myself for 40 years and it hasn't worked yet and I you know so I go to him as this child and say I need you, I need your help and I need to I don't I don't understand myself or you know what is this about me why do I keep doing this or why do I have this deep dream this deep desire that sets me on fire to come and encounter me come and encounter mm-hmm. me come reveal myself come reveal yourself to me and so it's it's simple really it's just going to God and asking to see his face because he's already drawing near to us. He's already here. We live in his universe. You know, it's his world. We're just living in it. And so Lord, reveal who you are, reveal your beauty, reveal your justice, reveal your truth. I, it's such a simple cry from my heart um, mm. of a daily encounter. You know, he corrects me and illumines me and guides me. And I hope it never ends. You know, I really do. Awesome. Awesome. Wonderful. And, 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 <clears throat> Uh, you know, part of being uh, living with Christ as King is, is is living in obedience to that King. You know, we owe Him our allegiance. Uh, we have to approach uh, Christ, even though He's friend and Savior and uh, and our and the lover of our souls. If you're talking about this divine glory, there's still um, a radical obedience, which is the proper uh, response to that to that love. How do we how do we grow in obedience to Christ, especially when we seem to have unruly passions and desires that sometimes pull us away from the Lordship of Christ? What advice would you give somebody who's like, I want to live with Jesus Christ as Lord, but I'm just struggling to to get things under His Lordship? Uh, well, I think we all do. That's sin, isn't it? That's the journey. That's the battle that Saint Paul talks about. That we all have parts of our hearts. We have parts of ourselves that we do stuff we shouldn't be doing, and. I know I shouldn't be doing it, but I'm doing it. No, there's reasons why we do what we do. But I think to to really be honest about that and say, Lord, you know, I, I, need, I need your help. I need, what, what is this going on here? And sometimes, you know, it's a neglect of our intelligence in a sense that I don't, I'm ignorant of my faith or I just don't want to. I want to do what I want to do and don't tell me what to do. Okay, so sometimes we're just like that and we just want to do what we want to do. We don't want to obey. But to obey really means to listen and mm-hmm. to hear. And ultimately, God... God is not asking us, when he asks us to obey him, he's not asking us to obey him as a tyrant. He's actually asking us to obey what's going to make us happiest and what we want to begin with. And, you know, if everybody watched the Olympics this last summer, I think, and we watched Michael Phelps again when, you know, pretty much every medal there was to be won. And, you know, there's a discipline that came from that. There's a whole, I mean, he went to rehab. I mean, he, he had a whole life discipline. But you see that discipline for what, a discipline not to be miserable because I'm sure at times it was hard for him to understand but a discipline to become excellent and that's what we're called to as human beings is to a, a love of excellence and so that means I need to do what I need to do because Christ is asking me to be obedient because it's going to lead me to glory it's going to make me complete as a person it's going to lead me to excellence as a person and the more I'm at war with him the more it seems like these rules are being imposed upon me but honestly you know what what I think I love about Christianity is I love that Christianity is rational it is rational. And so any question that we have, well, why do I have to do this? The church provides and the gospels provide a reason why we do what we do. And it might be hard because excellence is hard. Love is hard. I mean, as you both know, as married men, it, it's hard, but it's worth it and it's beautiful. And the more I can give myself, even when it's difficult, to that discipline of excellence, the more beauty my life takes on. And sometimes that means going to 12-step Meetings means kind of counseling. If you're an addict, if we're addict, you know, I'm a recovering addict myself, and so that's constant maintenance of me going and receiving mercy and, and, and freedom and truth and correction and honesty. But ultimately, in the end, that's what we want anyway. It's a very interesting paradox. Yeah, yeah. You know, we had uh, uh, one by the name of Grace that's on with us this afternoon, and she said, 
When we say, Lord, I open myself to you in our prayer, how can we know that we are truly and uh, completely opening ourselves to him? And that's, that's an excellent question. Excellent question, because I think sometimes we get, we want the signs or the evidence that, that this is actually happening. Um, you know, and, and Sister Paul, how would, how would you respond to that question? You don't want to. Paul, you explain you want to check? Um, can you repeat the question, John? Yeah, she, you know, Gracious wants to know, when we say, Lord, I open myself to you, how can we know that we are truly and completely opening ourselves to him? Well, I, honestly, I, I mean, you don't really know other than your, if your prayer is authentic and you're surrendering your life to God, you trust that, that the Lord obviously hears your prayer. I think what we struggle with, and I know I struggle with, is we feel like our prayers aren't answered when we want them to be answered. Uh, not as quick as we want, or we don't see the results. And the interesting thing about Advent, it's a time of waiting. It's it's literally sitting with Mary, who, who's pregnant, who's expecting, who probably at times, you know, felt the uncomfort of it all and just wanted it to be done and over with. And yet she had to wait um, that whole period. And so in our own prayer of surrender, there's this discipline, as Sister talks about, of, of waiting and trusting that God's with us in our prayer, even though we don't feel like it's being answered. Sure, sure. Sister, you want to add anything to that? And I think it is that continual asking of, of surrender. And I can tell, you know, by my life, you know, what are some of the fruits? Like, you know, by, by the fruits, you know, the tree. You know, what, what, what kind of fruit is my life bearing? And so... My life is bearing good fruit. It's good indication that I am surrendering more and more to the kingship and lordship of God. If my life is not bearing good fruit, I might want to look at that again and say, what are the barriers? Because all we all have barriers of what is my barrier of deeper surrender? What is my barrier that's preventing me? Is it that I don't trust God? Maybe I do think God is a tyrant. I mean, you know, just that, so we know ourselves and kind of like, what am I, what am I facing here? And then, you know, ask the Holy Spirit to come and, and, and open my heart, you know, open my heart, break down the barriers, renounce those areas in my life where, you know, I'm living in fear or discouragement or despair and, you know, try to allow Christ more deeply as I, and he's already there, but to allow that to flourish for Sure. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, you know, Grace and whoever else is listening, you know, this, this love of the Lord that comes from us is an act of our will. And if you say to the Lord, I open my heart to you, right? Understand that, you know, doors open slowly, and the more they open, the wider they get. You know, we don't, you don't, don't feel like you have to open your life completely to God the first time you do it. Because you're going to find out, even though you said, I open my life to completely to God, that God's going to show you other ways that you need to open up. But that continual yes, and like Paul said, that trust that the Holy Spirit is going to lead us and get us there. You know, like, we just have to, 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 to put ourselves in the position where we let God uh, get into our lives and do what he needs to do. And that is what prayer is about. It's like just being with the Lord and saying, okay, Lord, do what you do in the way that you do it. And us kind of detaching from having this unrealistic expectation that if I say, Lord, I open my heart completely to you, that some other one prayer is going to fix us. And it's going to change everything. It's going to start. It's a step. But we need to know that we're in this for the long haul. Like Sister said, you know, we've got brokenness that sometimes God does quick miracles and heals. Other times it's just working it out over time in cooperation with his ongoing grace at work in our hearts. And so, you know, trust that, you know, you know your own heart. In fact, your heart is the only thing that you have that you can give to God that no one else can give. And he's the, that's the thing he's most desirous of. So if you say to him, God, Lord, I give you my heart, he's going to run to you. And he's going to draw very close to you, much closer than you could ever draw to him. You know, that's the, the beauty of it is, is we don't have to go very far. You know, the, the, you know, the prodigal son was a, a long way off when the father spot, spotted him and he ran to him. Why? Because the father, the, the prodigal son turned back. He just made that simple move like I'm going back to my father and the father, you know, ran to him. You know, so that's, a, that's, that's just a beautiful thing. Um, and just having that trust. Um, you know, uh, Ali, uh, Alana is on uh, the, the call with us, and she said, I think opening yourself to prayer and knowing it's more, 
It is more like God peels you like an onion. More layers of ourself are peeled off as we grow closer to God. And I would say, yes, you know, we get that, that, that layer of our brokenness healed, layers of our personality, um, our unruly passions and desires get peeled away and become purified. And as we become more pure, uh, we are able to enter in more fully into communion with God. This is, this is, we're given a lifetime because we need a lifetime to grow in our relationship with Christ. And, you know, I always say we're, we're, we're practicing Catholics because someday all this practice is going to pay off and we're actually going to be good Catholics. <laughs> and that'll be nice. I'm looking forward to that day. But, uh, you know, the most important thing is, like Paul said, trust and, uh, and continue to move forward. And knowing that our King and our God is more desirous of us at any moment than we are of Him. And all we need to do is just open our hearts a little bit and He'll do the rest. Because he's that, he's that awesome. He's that wonderful. Uh, you know, and I want to encourage, if you have um, uh, any other uh, thoughts, any other ideas, you know, like another a follow-up question. We'll get to this. I'm going to ask um, Paul to kind of share a little bit. Keep putting those questions up there. We will get to them all. But Paul, you know, obviously, you know, sister has a beautiful uh, community of love that supports her and a community of prayer and, and, and all that. You and I are married guys with children. We have uh, lots of bills to pay, uh, lots of little things to deal with, big things to deal with day in and day out. Um, practically speaking, what, the, what does it mean for a man of God like yourself to, to, to live uh, and experience the lordship of Christ and the kingship of Christ uh, day in and day out? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces. And I think, you know, for all of us, including sister, life's busy. It's crazy. Uh, a lot of moving parts. And I think oftentimes we feel like, um, how do we even evaluate our relationship with God, right? Which I find interesting that right before Advent begins uh, is the Sunday of Christ the King, where, where, where the church is saying, you know, God is, is God, He's Jesus is King and Lord of all. And it really, it really places us in a position to ask the question, is, is Jesus Lord of our life? And I don't know about you guys, but but that time of year, I'm walking through the stores and the Christmas stuff is already out. Uh, it's Advent for us as Catholics, but certainly we're attracted by Thanksgiving, shopping, um, all, the, all the things that, that surround us. And, and then it just flies by. And this is what I find so important about Advent is that it, it really sets us up as Catholics to enter into the mystery of God. But for me, here are the three things that I really struggle with, and I find in my conversation with people that they struggle with. One is busyness, um, and, and two is materialism and envy, uh, and three is worry and stress. And uh, I, I'm struggling with one of those at some point. And I know a lot of people during this time and season, those, those things are sort of even heightened more around the holidays. And it's interesting because Advent, we have this imagery to draw us into Jesus, to draw us into God. So if you're struggling with busyness, uh, as I often do, um, Mary and Joseph take this very slow journey to Egypt, where she's riding on a mule, he's walking, she's pregnant, and uh, it's the middle of the night. They don't know where they're going to go or stay. Uh, and that image of their journey to Egypt um, calls us to slow our pace down and to ask the question, am I walking the pace that Jesus wants me to in my life? Or am I way ahead of it, right? Mm -hmm. Because if Jesus, Jesus is Lord, he's also leader, right? And that's something that we have to look at. The, the second materialism and envy, and often I struggle during this time and season, what are people getting and having and buying and all these things, uh, there's no greater image during this season for us than the manger that calls us to simplicity. There's nothing more simple than the manger. I, I don't know exactly what it looked like, but I know it didn't look like Sister's Curtains uh, in her background. <laughs> you, sure. I know that. I exactly what look of the manger, Paul George. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> But the, the image of the manger, that, that simplicity that Mary and Joseph and Jesus um, stated, and um, that, that's, a, that's an image that I often long to be in. Uh, and the worry and stress, the third thing uh, during this time and season, um, 
Jesus says, come to me, all you who are in labor and burden, I will give you rest. And uh, often, uh, you know, when Mary was first pregnant, she goes and, and visits uh, Elizabeth. And uh, Elizabeth says, who am I that, that the mother of our Lord should visit me? And Mary's like, what? I'm here. And Jesus is, is within her. And they come to visit Elizabeth. And they stay with her. Both of them, the Lord and Mary, stay with Elizabeth. And that's exactly what Jesus and Mary want to do with us. They just want to stay with us. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, I think what you uh, what you shared, Paul, resonates with a lot of people on this webinar. You know, we we know that this is a very holy time that gets very much encroached upon by very worldly concerns. Uh, just we try to do too much. We want to spend too much. We want to, we, we want to please everybody, and that causes us a stress. Um, you know, I'm looking at some of the con uh, comments. Uh, you know, like people are struggling out there. Um, we'll get to these. Uh, uh, somebody said, you know, college, they're a college student that's with us. Uh, Gabrielle, uh, going, off the shows, going off the problem of worry and stress, college can be stressful not only with school, but also with feeling alone and not fitting in. How do I walk with Jesus this Advent season when I feel lonely? You know, it's oftentimes I think, you know, we can get very much caught up in loneliness. Uh, you know, uh, what do you think, uh, uh, Sister? You know, what, what advice would you give to somebody who's like going into Advent feeling lonely and like they don't fit in? I think that that's a, a probably a sentiment that we all have at times. You know, how many of us at times you just feel utterly alone and you feel like, man, does anybody see me or does anybody understand me? And I think of inviting Christ into that, not trying to numb it. I think the first temptation, like Paul was saying, is to numb it, like through getting busy or getting more stuff or a bit but I think really to take time to to visit a church go visit Christ you spend time in front of a nativity scene I love that Paul brought up the imagery of nativity and you think of Christ of his life um you know, uh, many times of him being incredibly lonely and how he takes that on he understands that and I think to really get to the bottom of that but I think also oh, it's really important for us this is also a season of giving as well like Christ you know God gives his son to us and so it's also a season to maybe there's people in my life that need a visit. Maybe there's people in my life where I can go and visit them or go reach out to them. And it's amazing what many times that some reaching out can do. That it It's a gift to both people. So to really uh, acknowledge that part of us and allow Christ to encounter that part of us, but also to reach out to others as well. Because all of us you know, have those parts of that are lonely at times. And we all know people that maybe live alone or in nursing homes or just really some great opportunities and seats and to reach out and to be a human to other people <laughs> and to meet them one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's whenever I pray the rosary and I'm, and I'm meditating upon uh, the, the joyful mysteries and we get to uh, the visitation, I'm always struck by... What Paul is saying, like the, the the mother of God comes to us to serve us, you know, even in the midst of her own, you know, I mean, I love her first response to the angel. How can this be? You know, like she didn't have all the answers. She wasn't given like perfect foreknowledge of how everything was going to work out for her. But even in her state where, you know, you'd think, oh, pamper me, watch over me, care for me. She's coming out of herself. And I think sometimes that's a great cure for loneliness is just for us to come out of ourselves and do something that serves other people. And I think during this season, it's, it's so important for us to remember that um, we need real contact with people, not just the things, you know, not the materialistic things. Like people, uh, you know, and Jerry Seinfeld has this great bit where he says, look, every gift that you're going to buy and get to somebody some, this, to somebody this season, it's going to end up in, in a dump eventually, Okay. It's going to end up in a dump, but the love that we share is going to go on into eternity. Let's not forget that. You know, like the giving of our hearts makes us better people. And you want to know how we can live under the Lordship of Christ and serve Christ as Lord and King? It's by serving other people. It's not about us, you know, like, like how do I serve the King? By serving his children, those who are made in his, his image and likeness, the Christ that's right in front of you. And being able to pray and recognize Christ in the person in front of you and serve that person as if you were serving Christ himself, because you are. That is the face of Jesus, that, that, that broken human face that, 
that, that relative that frustrates you, that, that co-worker that irritates you. That's the place of Christ that we can love and honor uh, through our lives and, and, and reveal that Christ is the king. You know, and, and it's, it's very human. It's not super spiritual. Like sometimes we think, oh, what's going on in me? Is Christ my king? It's like, how do we treat other people? That's a good indicator. You know, how willing yeah. to be like the blessed mother and come out of ourselves. Um, yeah, John, uh, you know, one of the things uh, to, to go along with, with what you and sister were saying is I, I love the line from Elizabeth where she says, who is it that the, the mother of our Lord should come to me? which means Mary and Jesus come and That's an authentic feeling, a human feeling that she had. I don't deserve for you to come visit me. Mm -hmm. I'm lonely. I, I'm old and pregnant. I, I, this is weird. What's going on, you know, with Elizabeth and, and, uh, and, and, and yet Mary and Jesus come and stay with her. And in the midst of our loneliness, I think that one of the greatest heresies of Christianity today is that, um, people begin to believe that once I know Christ or get involved in the church, everything's great. Uh, yeah. All my issues and problems go away. And that's, that's a big fat honking lie. It, it's simply not true. And we see in the gospel that Jesus continuously comes into our mess. This is what Advent is. Advent is proof that Christ came to the messy world that messy world is included in our messy hearts, our messy lives, our confusion, our brokenness, our loneliness. And that for me was a turning point. That was a transition in my conversion of going from I believe in God to Jesus is Lord of my life because he's willing to come into, into this broken guy, into this sinful guy, into this lonely guy and transform me from the inside out. Uh, I had a dirty manger. I still do. But Christ comes in, you see. And the, the, the true belief in Christ is believing that, that, that Christ comes in our messiness and in the messiness of this world. Amen. Amen. I love that. You know, and I think, I, think, I think there's a freedom that comes when we understand that the only thing that God can bless are yeses and messes. And all you have to do is say, I'm a mess. Here's my yes, Jesus. Yes to you. Come in and do what you do. Now, we don't have to clean up for the Lord. We have to let the Lord come in and clean us up. He's the redeemer. I think sometimes we think, oh, I have to redeem certain aspects of my life and get it in proper order, and then Jesus can embrace it. And it's not. He's the redeemer. He's the one that comes into that mess. And, and when, we, when we embrace that and, 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 and kind of find joy in that, then living under the lordship of Christ is so much easier. Now, I, uh, sister mentioned Lord of the Rings, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Tolkien nut. I love I love reading the books, and there's so much more to the books than the movies. But like like when we think of the king, you know, and, and, and this is like any any movie you've ever watched where there's a king who conquers, right? The king comes in, his armies conquer, and those conquered enemies at some point, right? They come into the throne room, and the king's sitting up there on his throne. You know, I've conquered you. Kneel before me and pledge your allegiance, or you will die. You know, and so when we think of what does it mean to, 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 to be conquered by Jesus the King? For me, he conquered me with love. I mean, he, he, he doesn't take what's not freely given to him. Our, our Lord conquers with love. He broke down my resistance, my fears, my doubts by pouring out just an incredible amount of love and mercy upon me at a moment in my life when I was completely lost. When I didn't know who I was or why I was on this earth, the king of the universe conquered my brokenness, my resistance, my sin by just this massive outpouring of grace. And that's, you know, for me, you know, when I look at it and I say, you know, if Jesus, what is the geography of my heart where Jesus is at work yet? And how can I... Continue to surrender that to the Lord. Where, where are there still, where's this, the brokenness still in my life? That's what I want to do because every time I've surrendered another part of my heart to his lordship, he's come in and made it shine. He's redeemed it. He's turned it around. And, and to have that kind of king in my life. You know, if the, if the Old Testament teaches us anything, is that human beings make lousy kings. You know, like when the, the people of Israel broke up and said, 
All the nations around us, Lord, have kings. We want a king. We want a king. And the Lord's like, you have no idea what you're asking for. I'm your king. No, we don't want a God king. We don't want a, 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 the, the, the ultimate authority king. We want a human king like everyone else has. And, and, and God's like, okay, be careful what you ask for. And he gave them a number of human kings that just totally screwed up everything. You know, worship false gods, disobeyed God's commands, led the people, corrupt, broken men. And when we try to be our own kings, we do a really lousy, lousy job of it. We need the protection of Christ. One of the things I, I shared in the description is like, what are the five amazing benefits of having, uh, you know, Jesus Christ as king of your life? And I want to share those, and then we're going to get back and answering some more of your questions. Like, number one, when you have a king, and, you know, think of this. Why did the king have a castle with high walls and, and thick, you know, stone and high towers with guards? Because when enemy invaders would come to that land, everyone would be invited to find refuge and protection in that castle. That's why the king built a huge castle. That's where his people would go when the foreigners would invade. And we have in Christ our strong tower. We can go to him. That's number one. He's our strong tower where we can always seek refuge and protection when we are under attack. He will stand with us. He will guard us. He will protect us. That's his oath as king. Number two, he can bring into submission all of my unruly passions, emotions, and desires. The ones that I can't have, that I can't seem to control, Jesus Christ can be the Lord over those. And I give those to him, and he gives me the strength and he gives our, he me the grace to overcome. Third, he has an army of angels that he's always willing to send to me to guard me, protect me, and guide me. I have my own personal guardian angel assigned to me by my king who's got my back, my front, my sides, my top, my bottom. He's always there. You know, and, and, and when I'm under a certain attack, that army of angels can come to me because Jesus Christ is my Lord and King. Fourth, and this one comes from uh, uh, the, the Return of the King, and it's a, a scene that's kind of not given enough credit in the movie, and that's that uh, there's the House of Healing that the oh, King, I love that. Yeah. where where Faramir, after he gets wounded in battle, goes, and, it, and you, you see it in the in the movie. He pours water on his wounds, and then he lays hands on him, and, and, and he, he can't see that he's actually praying, but you get the sense in Tolkien's mind that the king is praying for the healing of Faramir. And he's restored. Not just restored physically, but he comes out of there a different person. You know, you see him at the end of the movie, this, this boy who wondered if his father loved him, who always lived in the shadow of his, his mighty warrior brother. He's a different person when the king gives his hands of healing upon him. And that's what our God does. He has that power, those hands of healing to heal any one of our broken wounds. And finally, and, and Sister Miriam talked a lot about this in her sharing, is that his kingdom is a kingdom of, of love where our hearts can drink of the joy and peace and love that we most desperately thirst for. And our God pours that out and lavishes it upon his subjects with abundance. So how do I live under the Lordship of Christ? I have a prayer I pray every morning. Lord God, I, play, I pledge my allegiance to you. I give you my heart, my life, and my work. In return, I ask that you give me the grace to obey your every command to the fullest possible extent. That's the first thing I pray every morning when I get on my knees to pray. I just pledge my allegiance to the Lord. Do I feel in that moment this awesome connection? No. But it plays itself out during the day when I am called to obey, when I'm called to love, when I'm called to make a particular movement, the grace is there. Why? Because I've made that fundamental decision that I want to put Jesus Christ on the throne of my heart every day. I want to enthrone him and say, Jesus, you're, you're the king. You sit on the throne. And I think as we grow in that, as we learn to do that, he'll expose and he'll reveal the areas of our heart that need particular attention by his grace, by his spirit, forgiveness, healing, whatever. Sometimes he, he you know, he, he polishes us like silver. Sometimes he hits us on the side of the head with a two by four because that's what we need. But it's all good because as the Lord, he knows what we need. You know, so, you know, that's, that's kind of where, where I am with the whole, the whole thing with, with Jesus being the king. Um, let's see. 
we have, I don't know if you guys, are, can you see the question, but there's one on here. Um, yeah, for some reason, it just is blank. But, yeah. Okay, well, I, I'm just going to share that th there's a, a, a woman online with us today, and she wrote in, I'm the mom of a family, she's a single mom. I'm the mom of a family that had suffered great abuse and trauma. I'm working with a team of counselors, and some of my kids have drifted from God because of the pain. How can I best lead them? How can I best lead us through this time of suffering as we work through the need of counseling and healing process? And her children range in age from 11 to 22. She said, it's so painful to see them not recognize God's love for them despite the pain of their young lives. That's a heavy burden to carry. And, uh, you know, let's just take a moment to pray. Um, and then we'll... Uh, maybe whatever is on the heart. Lord God, we just lift up uh, this situation, Catherine and her family, and as you pour out your grace upon her and her children as they seek healing under the Lordship of Christ. And as, as, a, as a loving mother who has a deep passion to see her children come to know the love of Christ, we ask that you especially bless Catherine with all the grace that she needs. Jesus, we just entrust this to you, knowing that whatever you give us in terms of crosses and suffering, will bear fruit of righteousness and salvation as we will continue to submit to your, your Lordship and healing. And Blessed Mother, we pray for your intercession as well. Amen. So Paul, you're getting ready to say something. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm a product of a, of a single mother home, a uh, divorced family, and uh, I, I definitely feel you know, the pain of, uh, of this woman. And, uh, you know, there, there's no good answer other than, uh, you know, first of all, just just honestly giving your life to the Lord um, and, and trusting your kids, even though, you know, they're certainly affected by the situation. And I don't know the, the whole situation, but um, I know as a parent now for kids that, um, you come to a place as a parent where you realize that your kids aren't yours. They're God's. They belong to him. And so certainly you can do everything you can to form them and help them and guide them. Uh, but ultimately, um, just like Mary did with Jesus, as hard as it was as an earthly mother, she had to hand Jesus back to the Father and let go. And, and, and we have to give our kids and trust to the Lord. And so I'm going to in particularly be praying for the situation through Advent. So th I want to just thank whoever it is for sharing her story with us. Thank you. Sister, you know, I, I, I've been blessed to hear you share about your life and some of the things that you've gone through. And you have, you know, you're shining an example of that continued faith and working out the things that you need to work out with the Lord in such a beautiful way. What would, what would you want to want to say to her? Well, my heart goes out to her. I mean, that's just tremendously painful, and I, you know, the suffering. That's that's really, you know, for every generation, that's always the question, isn't it? If God is so good, then why is there so much suffering? And all of us have said that, you know, why why would God allow this to happen? You know, and as we wrestle with those things, I think that to be continually, you know, um, in twelve step groups, you know, with you know, how do we recover? H O W how by being honest, open, and willing. And I think for. Um, for her to continue to preach, like Paul is saying, to the Lord in honesty, openness, and willingness, and allow Him to continue to encounter you. And it's not an easy journey; like life is messy, as you know everybody knows. But I think that to hold on to the truth of that, and I, I really think that to remind ourselves, and that's really the why the gospel is good news. It's that the suffering is not the end of the story. The story isn't over in your family, and if she's listening to her, you know this, this, that's not the end of the story. I mean, that God will work miracles through that as we continue to allow him to, to transform it. And, um, but it's true, we, we all have to do our own work. But I think if there's a particular scripture passage of one of encouragement, or maybe it's just spending time with Christ's death and resurrection, you know, those are truths. Like the, the word of God is living and effective. And so that might be really helpful, even in your bathroom mirror, to put one of your favorite scripture passages that reminds you that God is sovereign. And that he sees you, he knows you, he loves you. And this story is not the end. It is not the end. God will bring glory to it. Yep. yep. Somebody said, hey, how do we grow in trusting that Christ will come through for us? I pray for a greater trust every day. But what are some practical tips for trust in his kingship? 
you know, I would just say, you know, I, I'm a big fan of St. Therese of Lisieux. Uh, I can I can really relate to her spirituality and her feeling a little and inadequate and needing so much. And she's she, her life and her her prayers and her writings have taught me so much about trusting the Lord. And one of the things that you know she she has shared is that we can never show God the love He deserves, but we show God that we love Him by trusting in His love. So how do we trust? How do we grow in trust in Christ? I'll share real briefly. It's just a matter of giving him the things that I struggle with and not being afraid to do that. To saying to God, I will be completely honest with you in my prayer. So when I show up on prayer to, to pray someday, and my you know, I'll pray that prayer. And Jesus, I pledge my allegiance to you. I give you my heart, my life, and my work in exchange. Give me the grace of obeying your commands to the fullest possible extent. So I submit to it. But then I'll say, God, I'm just struggling. And I don't even know if I want to pray right now because I'm struggling. I feel distracted. I'm feeling this. It's very much in the in the in the vein of what Saint Ignatius uh, taught his uh, his his people his, people in his order to pray. It's like just take all your feeling in that and give that to Christ and say, okay, I want to trust you, Jesus, but I'm struggling. I have a hard time letting go of this. And the most important thing is after you say these things and be honest with God. <clears throat> is just let God speak back to you on that. Because he wants to speak to you directly where you're struggling. And he, he cares about you. He wants you to know that he is aware and able to deal with it. And if we don't come to God honestly, we'll never get that response that he is more than capable of dealing with this. He might not fix it right that in the moment. Most times he doesn't. But he'll let us know and we can continue to move forward. What, what would you add, Sister Paul? Feel free to jump in. Paul, what would you? I think if um, I think if trust was easy, Jesus would have said that in the scripture, yes. right? He would have just said, "Trust is easy. Don't worry about it." And uh, I think at the moment of his deepest trust, he sweat drops of blood mm -hmm. in the garden, uh, where he was like, "Father, I don't know what's going on, uh, but I trust in you." It was painful. The trust was painful. Sometimes trust is easy. Sometimes it's very difficult. And I, Sister mentioned earlier, and I kind of want to bookend it a little bit because I don't want to forget, is uh, the sacraments remind us of who God is. Do this in remembrance of me. It's, it, it, God continuously reminds us it, in our life and walk with Christ, uh, we have to, as humans, be reminded of his love. And one of the greatest ways we're reminded of that is do the sacraments where where God tangibly says, "Remember that I love you." Remember that every mass or every confession, that's what God does for us. He He reminds us um, that He's there, and when we know God's there, even though we don't feel it, it it's easier for us as humans to trust in His in His plan. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you for uh, reminding us. I, I honestly believe that one of the one of the most painful wounds that we all have because of original sin is we have really poor short term memory of the goodness of God. We can forget so easily in the midst of the day to day how awesome our God is and how passionately He is in love with us. How He is always on our side, always there, closer than than our next breath to animate us and give us hope, you know, and, and all the ways that he's proven to, to, to us himself faithful over the years, we can forget in those moments and fall into almost a panic of, oh my gosh, how's, you know, boy, oh boy, you know, like, and I, and, and I pray for that. I like, I pray, God, don't let me forget because you're kind you know, and he said that, remember me, right? Do this in remembrance of me. You know, that, that's beautiful, Paul. Thank you for sharing that. And also thank you for reminding us that in the garden, Jesus' trust was, was the most painful thing, you know, that brought him to his knees and caused him to sweat blood. You know, if that's, if that's the way the Lord looked out his trust in his Father, why would it be any different for us? Why should we expect it to be easier for us to find ourselves growing in trust? That's hard. Um, Let's see. Uh, did you want to? Did you have anything you wanted to add to that in terms of growing in no, trust? No, not really. I was just 
right? I mean, really trust is like, it's like a muscle, right? I mean, we grow, we, uh, we, a muscle grows stronger by use of it, especially, you know, and if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever been snow skiing, you know, you, uh, the next day you're sore, you're sore muscles you didn't know you had, <laughs> you know, and so I think that, uh, you know, all of us have opportunities every day throughout our, our day. Am I going to worry or am I going to choose to trust? And I think it's those times where I, I mean, I don't know, I guess I'm very introspective. I have to go like, why am I not trusting here? Like what's triggering me? And so I'm kind of like, what's, what's the deal here? So I can confess that or I can allow God to heal that. But I think many, many times it is choosing like, Lord, I, I'm just going to choose to trust you here. I, you've, I've looked through the gospel. You've never failed. Those who put their trust in you are never put to shame. And I am going to choose, even though it looks crazy, I'm not going to trust you. I'm, I'm not going to worry about this. And it's easier said than done, like Paul said, but it really is a must that becomes easier to use when we when we use it yeah and to add to that um sister uh you know one of the things about working out or sports is that we can get bored with it and yeah. so sometimes changing your workout helps you reinvigorate working out and uh, right. you know we're coming out of ordinary time where we're just kind of coast mode and i think advent is a hard right turn in the reality spiritually and we have to ask the questions advent i do as well is how does god want me to change my routine so i can wake up to the reality of the life that he's calling me to live because i've been sort of sleeping through ordinary time and i need to decide like how am i gonna how am i gonna change my routine so i don't get bored what is god asking me to do so i can trust more so maybe i need to wake up earlier and pray or maybe i need to go to mass more during the week or uh, maybe I need to make a list of people I need to reach out to. I need to do something that's going to help me to uh, grow some muscles that have been sort of relaxing. Sometimes we just have to do that. And I think Advent's sort of this wake up call for us to, um, mm -hmm. to uh, you know, maybe the prayer you've been praying for trust just seems to be getting old. Find a new one, you know, find something new to do that kind of pops you out of it and says, okay. And I know one of the things that I um, I, I did through a season uh, through spiritual direction, uh, my spiritual direction suggested that uh, in my prayer that I don't ask God for anything. That mm. I simply just talk to God and ask God how he's doing. Oh, that's and, great. And I, and I went through two months of that. And it, it just changed my whole attitude of prayer, my whole attitude of I would see what was happening is I was going into prayer constantly saying, God, here's everything in my life. Woe is me. I need this. I need this. I need this. I trust in you. And what, what this did is it just popped me out of that rhythm into a new rhythm. And it was good for me. It was good for me at that time. So Advent does that for us. And so maybe we need to ask the question, what is it that God wants me to do this Advent that's going to pop me into a new routine, a new reality of who I am through the lenses of God. Yep. I love it. You know, because I, I think you're right. You know, we're waiting, but we're also preparing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the, the call of, uh, you know, the uh, prepare the way of the Lord. I I know for me, one of the things that had, that kind of broke me through and got me to a new level of uh, intimacy with Christ. And that's the thing, you know, like the, the, you know, when I put together the title, I, you know, the, the, the first line is, um, Come, let us adore him. You know, that, that's one of my favorite hymns. You know, come, let us adore him. You know, God, you know, when we, when we think about making Jesus Christ, he wants to be adored. And what I realize is in my heart, if I'm so full of myself and so full of my anxieties and so full of my concerns and so full of the materialistic things that are happening around me, and it's so easy for me to get caught up in those things every day, that the thing that really has helped me is fasting. If you want to do something this Advent that will kick your spirituality to the next level, fast. Create some room for God to do something. I remember Pope Benedict the Sixteenth uh, a few years ago. He talked about making room for God, and he said, "You know, in the midst of your life, when Jesus Christ knocks on the door and you open it up, will there be room for Him to actually come in?" Or will you be so full of yourself and the concern of this world that he's like, you've opened your heart, but I can't come in because there's no room for me. Give something up, whether that be food, television, 
uh, some comfort that you cling to, whatever it is that you turn to, to you know, when you feel things, give that up for a while and say, okay, I'm not going to turn to that. I'm going to turn to you, Christ. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if you create that space that will be filled by, by God, and the more space we create, for God in our lives through denial and, and letting go um, for uh, it, it, the more space we'll have for Christ to come in and dwell. And, 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 and when he fills us, he fills us with love and peace and joy. And when we're full of these other things, mm-hmm. we simply can't. There is no spiritual progress without a level of renunciation. I mean, Jesus Christ himself said, said Look, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And so we must deny ourselves as we prepare to receive more of Christ. And I, I, I tell you that you won't find, a, I think, a better discipline that would, you know, help you break through uh, and, and, and deepen your spirituality than fast. And if you haven't, done, if you haven't tried it, man, then go for it. Um, somebody, uh, what else? Somebody said, uh, yeah, it was uh, Sarah who wrote in and said, uh, <clears throat> I was told that Advent is similar to when we prepare ourselves for Jesus. And that's absolutely true. It's a special time of preparation, a special time of being with the Lord. Um, with so much going on, what are ways to prepare yourselves for Jesus? I just shared about fasting. And, and she also said, by the way, it's not too much to ask. Her boyfriend, Josh, is watching. And she wants me to say, Josh, God loves you. So there you go, Josh. You're loved by God. And I'm telling you right now, on the authority of the church, God, and the witness that Jesus Christ has been the Lord of my life, that he loves you, and he's coming after you, buddy. This, first of all, okay, John, you, you cannot ask her to marry you over webinar, okay? <laughs> but I'll tell you what, if, Josh, if you, got a girl, if you got a girl this good who's telling you that God loves you, she's a keeper. <laughs> uh, Josh, Josh just responded, dang it. <laughs> All right, yeah. John, here's the other thing. you got to communicate we'll, better. John, we'll, we'll do another <laughs> webinar on, on dating and all that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, let's go back. I don't, I don't want to skip over it. How, especially in the idea of adoring Christ and showing him love as we prepare, what are some other practical things people could do this Advent to, uh, to live more in that moment of lordship, of just communion? And being with Jesus Christ, sister, what would you what would you advise or share with people? Uh, well, I th- I certainly think taking concerted time to pray, and I, you know, um, as was mentioned earlier, if you have a nativity scene, it just if you could put it on your room or put it on a prayer room, it's really important just to kind of spend time there and just to re- just to reflect on the reality that Christ draws near to us. He started it, and He's so humble. God is so kind and so humble, and He just comes to dwell with us. You know. Uh, that is just, it completely changes kind of how we relate. And I think, to, you know, season also, this is a season also being as a family and with people. And so to really try to put the cell phone away and really talk to people and spend time with them, you know, when you have that opportunity, it really does make a huge difference. And I think just to really be, um, and I hate the word intentional right now because it's so cliche, but to really be intentional about spending time with the Lord and in that, you know, beautiful imagery and also with one another, looking at each other and in the face, eye to eye and listening, being present. Everybody wants somebody to be present to them. And we know when we're, when people are present to us and it makes a huge difference. So those are little things that we can do that really do change our lives. I agree. I, 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 I find it um, interesting, you know, that, uh, you know, we want to, learn how to be intimate with God, but we're not interested in learning how to be intimate with one another. How, how are we to grow in, in, in being real with God if we can't be real with one another? And, and that takes risk. That takes coming out of ourselves. And, and, but I have found, um, you know, when you, when, when you do that, the, the fruitfulness of that in terms of just self-discovery and, and just growing in love for somebody, it comes from vulnerability. And, and, yeah, I'm not saying you tell your deepest secrets to everybody and broadcast them on the radio like that or post them on your Facebook wall, but I'm saying find somebody that you can be real with and learn how to do that because it'll spill over into your relationship with God. And having, like you said, put away the distractions and focus on people. That'll be a discipline that will spill over into your spiritual life as we do it more in the relationships we have. Caring more about being with people than 
you know, doing something for them or having them do something for you. It's great advice. Paul, what would you add? Um, so I'll just tell you what I, I'm doing for Advent. You know, to, to answer the question, the Advent's a mini Lent um, uh, to prepare our hearts for Jesus. Uh, so certainly prayer, but but what could what could revamp or lighten your, you know, enliven your prayer life? So I'm I'm gonna try to go to mass more, visit the sacraments more with my prayer life this this Advent. Um, two waiting, uh, that's a form of fasting. So so fast maybe from asking, fast from social media, fast from food, fast you, you know find something that you can that you could carve out some space, like John said earlier. Um, and so, you know, for me, uh, you know, I'm gonna fast from something. And then and then three, give during Advent. So in the middle of our table, we have an Advent wreath. Um, we also set up our Christmas tree already, don't judge. But anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> um, Laura, I don't know. Uh, I know, I know, I'm going to hell. Um, but in really our Advent wreath, um, um, in the background of Christian, we, we have a jar, a giving jar, this Advent that our family is giving to a mission in Haiti. Uh, it's called Haiti 180, which are going on a trip in the spring with Sean Forrest. You could visit, yeah, visit that website. But so for us, we're giving tangibly as a family. So those those things I think actively help us to carve out space, uh, so so that Christ can come uh, more intimately into our hearts. Mm. That's cool. When are you, when are you going out? I'm going down in March with, uh, with Sean. So spring break, we're doing a trip. Me and my family with Sean, and there's spaces for people to go. Uh, people want to go on a mission trip to Haiti, so they can go to Haiti180.com uh, to get information. Awesome. Uh, one of the traditions that my family has is uh, a few years ago, um, we bought this really cool looking uh, wooden crib and, and it is a, a baby Jesus, but we don't put baby Jesus in it Christmas. And during Advent, every time you do an act of kindness for uh, another member of the family, you get to take a piece of straw out of the straw uh -huh. and put it in the crib. And the idea is we want to make the crib as big and comfortable with full of straw so when Jesus comes, he has a great place to rest. And we, and we do that through, you know, little kindness. Um, during Lent, we have a, we make a, a, a dough crown and we stick toothpicks all through us. So it's like the crown of thorns. And every time you do a kindness to someone, you get to break off one of the thorns. And so by the end of Lent, if we, at the end of Lent, all the thorns are gone and we spray paint it gold and glue jewels all over it and then use it as a better piece at our Easter dinner. So little things, you know, to remind, you know, yourself of, of why you do, uh, why we do what we do. Um, we are a little bit over time. Uh, it's five, uh, it's a little after eight in the Eastern Seaboard. I'm in California, so it's a little after five. Um, I need to wrap up, but there's one last comment that I want to be able to, um, uh, share that's from Peter. He says, I'm, I'm a high school sophomore at an all boys school and I'm struggling. Following the commands of God our King to the best of my ability is exhausting. I feel sometimes drained of life due to the strains and hardships of Christian life. Part of the problem is that I sometimes get the sense that the quantity of my prayer exceeds the quality of my prayer. I know God's commands are supposed to be life giving and not life draining. What am I doing wrong? How can I submit myself to the authority of the life-giving king? Um, you know, Peter, first of all, your desire to serve God is beautiful. Your desire to know God is awesome. And your desire to love God is the greatest desire you could possibly have, um, except for the desire to know God's love for you first. First John chapter uh, uh, 4 we love because God loves us. I would, I would just encourage you, brother, to put aside all the expectations you have of yourself before Christ and come to him as, and just say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a broken bucket that leaks. Because obviously God's pouring grace, but it's not holy. Why are you leaking? Why are you, why are you able to hold this love in? And don't go to God saying, what are the demands? Go to God and say, look, 
I can't love you until you love me first. And I'm not going to leave this prayer until you speak love to my heart. And just hold God accountable to speak love to you. I know that I oftentimes try to perform and earn my father's love. I can forget so quickly that the first movement of God is his love for me. And everything that I am as a man and as a follower of Christ is in response to that movement of God's love for me. And when I find I'm struggling, I usually can step back and say, okay, you know what? I haven't just let God love me lately. I haven't. Because I get prideful. Oh, I can do this. I've got this, God. I don't need you as much. I don't need, you know. And then I'm like, no, I always need God's love. And in and, 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 and the eyes of God, I'm always his child. And a child always needs their father's love. They never outgrow that. Um, you know, I want to encourage you, you know, just go to God. And don't worry about the quantity or the quality of your prayer. Just be with God and say, God, this is one end. I want to know your love more. I want to serve you more deeply. I'm, I feel like I'm being drained. Uh, you know, I will also say there's times that it is exhausting to follow Christ. It is hard. But that shouldn't be the norm, and that shouldn't be the way you look at yourself. Like, you've got a problem following Christ. You should, you know, I, I would just encourage you to let yourself be loved by God. And I'm going to let Sister Paul, if you have anything you want to add to that. <laughs> That's what just came to my mind is maybe that's a great thing for Advent is just to ask God, Lord, show me how you love me. <laughs> show, you know, show me how you love me and banish all fear. You know, keep me from fear and show me how you love me. And that's, God delights to do that. He does. You know? And it's very simple. But that's what Advent is a season of simplicity. Yeah, I just want to affirm you, man. You're a teenager and you're on a webinar with a bunch of nerdy people, man. <laughs> so uh, good for you. Uh, and it's it's not easy, especially as a young person living for Christ. And so just know that showing up is half the battle. Don't worry about what to say to God. Just open your heart and make it real. Don't 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 make it formal. And uh, God's there. God's always there and shows up, even when it's difficult. So uh, keep pressing on, my friend. You got this. And 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 reject this idea that you're doing something wrong. Because Satan will grab a hold of that and try to mess with your mind and believe that not only you're, you're doing something wrong, but there's something wrong with you that's, that, that, that God can't work in. And that's not that's so far from the truth. That's a lie from the, from the depths of hell. You know, Peter, God, looks at you and he sees your honest desire, and he's going to reward that persevering prayer and just take time and let God love you and be transformed by that encounter with that love. And, you know, we, like I said, we, the, the, this was come let us adore him. I would encourage, you know, like, go to the Eucharist, sit before the Blessed Sacrament, even if it's not exposed in the monstrance, even if it's just in front of the tabernacle. If you can find that one other time a week where you can just spend 15, 20, maybe even 30 minutes just looking at Jesus and let him look at you. Don't come with an agenda. Don't come with a list of prayers. Just say, okay, Jesus, I'm just going to be here. You know, there's something beautiful about the Eucharist where it radiates God's love into our souls, whether we're aware of it or not. Like, if you were to take the Eucharist out of your church's tabernacle and put, like, a piece of radioactive isotope in there and just sit in front of it, that radiation would pour forth from the tabernacle and would permeate your body. It could even mutate you on the cellular level, and you would never feel it until it had completely changed you on the inside and maybe even done irreparable harm to you. In the same way, when we sit before that Eucharist, God radiates his love for and it, and it penetrates us, and it changes our souls in, its, in, in the very way they're constituted. But it's not in a bad way. It's always in a good way. We don't feel it. And you don't feel it as God's love is penetrating you sometimes, but it is. That's the promise of that, of that presence of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And the Spirit is poured forth for you. So if you're looking to, uh, to, to go deeper in this land, you know, spend some time just adoring uh, Christ and being with him in love. Amen. And if you're hungry, go make a sandwich. <laughs> That's me, <and> Paul. Uh, <laughs> listen, I want to say uh, a special thanks to, to, to Sister Miriam and, and to Paul for being a part of this. I want to thank everyone who uh, took time out of your busy admin. You know, he said, what can I do? Come on a webinar and listen to a bunch of 
weird people talk to you about Jesus for a bit. That might even help you grow in your faith. Any final words that you want to share, sister? Um, you are loved. God loves you, and you are dear to him, and he's drawing close to you now. Uh, that's the best. That's the good news. You are deeply, deeply loved. Amen. Amen. Paul, anything you want to yeah, no, this is great. Thanks, John, and for everyone listening. Uh, Sister has a book out, uh, Loved As I Am. It's, I, I think it's a great book. If you haven't gotten it, um, get it or get it for someone. It just speaks volumes about a lot of what we talked about today. And uh, Sister, I'm going to have you on my radio show soon, the Paul George show. We can talk more about that. So that can be on iTunes or on SoundCloud. You can find that. We have these conversations continually. And so there's great resources out there. So, John, thanks for doing this. And, um, you know, hopefully more and more people can uh, can log on and we can have these conversations. So thanks. Yeah. And this uh, this webinar was recorded and it will be up on studentbillconferences.com on our webinar page. We're going to be doing one uh, on December 7th, which is called The Art of Accompaniment. So if you do ministry, young person, or you're a parent, you want to know how to walk with a teen on a faith journey, what does that look like? In the, his letter to, uh, to the church, Pope Francis uh, in the Evangelic Audio said, we need to learn the art of accompaniment, how to walk authentically with people in a consistent, loving way so that we can lead them to Christ. And that's what that webinar is going to be about. And then on the 14th, we're going to have, it's called the breath of God, listening to the Holy Spirit. Because I think somebody else, we didn't get to it, but I wanted to point it out. That, that how do we know when, when we hear something uh, in prayer that it's God speaking? And we're going to be talking about that and the role of the Holy Spirit in, in making that uh, a reality for us. So uh, you'll find more information on how to register on our webinar page for those two webinars as well. Uh, before you log on, it, off, if you um, want to uh, text in the comments section here, any other ideas, topics that you would like us to address in webinar format, please feel free to do that. Once we get the webinar up, feel free to direct your friends who weren't able to be a part of this to that to, to watch it, and it'll, it'll be up soon. And once again, on behalf of uh, Sister Marion and Paul and myself and my, my staff and everyone who helps make these webinars happen, thank you. May God bless your advent. Stay close to his love and, and be that instrument that he needs you to be to uh, to make it a joyful uh, Christmas for yourself and uh, for your families, right? Everyone take care.